now, Bob Grant. WABC News. And let's be heard. Good afternoon, everyone. The telephone lines are open. The number to call in New York is 563-WABC. If you're calling from New Jersey, 201-489-WABC. In a program dedicated to the free and open exchange of ideas and of opinions. And what is on your mind this afternoon? Well, ladies and gentlemen... First of all, let me say that it is at a moment such as this that we can distinguish between public-spirited individuals who are trying to perform a public service and demagogic, shifty politicians. And I want to tell you that a lot of people naturally are talking about the bomb that went off and the explosion that it created and the lives that were tragically lost and the untold millions and millions and millions of dollars in damage and billions of dollars in displacement to the American economy. And, of course, they're talking as appropriately they should about the, the damage to our psyche, the fear that this is generating, the concern, the alarm... These are all understandable. These are all to be expected. And indeed, we should, we should think very seriously about what this may portend. But I had the displeasure this morning of watching a man of whom, I must admit, 20 years or so ago, I had an affection for. But a man who, as time went on, showed more and more, to me anyway, that he was an arrogant demagogue, an arrogant demagogue who is not really interested in performing a public service as he might have you believe, but was consumed by his own ego to such an extent that in every opportunity given to him, and there have been many, he used those moments, he used those many, many moments to prove that he is nothing but a self-serving, officious, supercilious, demagogue. Maybe some of you, the more perceptive amongst you, might have determined by this time that I'm talking about an individual that I have at off times called Il Supremo, his arrogance in Albany, and more recently a name that has a, a very loose literal translation into the English, but a Neapolitan dialect word Svachim, a Svachim, which, uh, for want of a better English counterpart, is jerk. But even Svachim is inappropriate because it doesn't do justice to the enormity of the repulsive behavior of this man. I saw him interviewed by the host of the Today Show, who can match Il Supremo when it comes to arrogance and conceit. But nevertheless, Mr. Gumbel was doing a job, a professional job, of interviewing a man you know as the governor of the state of New York. And at one point, Gumbel asked, quite correctly, I thought, about how New Yorkers would handle this searing blow to our sense of security. And he said, well, they're New Yorkers. They're not going to let this get them. They have survived depressions and recessions and a president sending up a vice president to make fun of us. And at that point I said, Cuomo, you are really a Svachim. 
At a time like this, you take a cheap political shot. How dare you equate... How dare you equate the chiding that former Vice President Dan Quayle gave New York. And he wasn't really ridiculing New York, but rather your stewardship of this state. And maybe that is why, at this inopportune, inappropriate moment, you saw fit to do some sleazy, cheap, pandering campaigning. It wasn't bad enough that his arrogance in Albany had to begin by telling Mr. Gumbel and the rest of America, presumably, that New Yorkers were magnificent. White, black. Why did he have to do that? Couldn't he have just have said that the New Yorkers were magnificent in how they handle this, period? Did he have to separate us again? Well, the answer to that, of course, is quite clear. If you are a panderer such as Il Supremo, then at every opportunity you do that. At every opportunity you delineate the racial groups, although he did leave Asians out. Hey, Spachim, you left out the Asians. Now, I have only contempt, only contempt for this man. And I can only hope that come November of 1994... There are enough New Yorkers who share that contempt so that we can end his imperious reign, which has already gone on far too long. I cannot believe that at a time like this, it would prove once again he's just a cheap two-bit politician. We had a great day Saturday. When I say we, I'm talking about the people here at WABC. I'm talking about the Leukemia Society of America. I'm talking about Teddy Lukakis and all the wonderful people at the Rio Diner. By the way, I understand there was a, a splendid article in the News Tribune, which I neglected to, to peruse. A splendid article, a photo showing me waving a, I believe it was a $100 bill, which had uh, just been donated. And uh, if any of you folks listening to the Bob Grant program right now do have a copy of that page with a picture in the story, I would appreciate you sending it in. I wouldn't ask the News Tribune to do that, because I know I'd be wasting my time. But it was a splendid day, and we did, we did chalk up a record last year. In the diner itself, in the famed Rio Diner, the world's most famous diner, we collected uh, $4,000, a little over $4,000. This year, we collected a little over $9,000, and uh, that was inside the diner itself. A grand total of about $28,000 was pledged, and we're all proud of our part in, in doing it. And once again, I want to thank Teddy Lukakis. I know it cost Teddy a good piece of change to uh, have the uh, big fundraiser over there, hiring special security and uh, other costs that he incurred. He'd be embarrassed if, I, if he knew I was saying this. I hope he's not listening. Can't thank him enough. People take it for granted. That, ah, well, you know, it's, uh, it's just something he's been doing, but uh, he does it because he believes in the Leukemia Society of America, and he believes in this country. Yes, John? Just a quick comment, Bob. In my opinion, I feel the bombing wouldn't have happened if Bush or Reagan were still president. I feel that there would have been such a power out there that, as in the past, these, the terrorists would have thought twice before doing things like this. But I think this is just the beginning of things to come with a weak administration. Well, it could very well be. could very well be. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm glad you mentioned uh, uh, Ronald Reagan uh, because a... Uh, Symposium was held uh, at Princeton, New Jersey over the weekend. Uh, leaders of the former Soviet Union and uh, of the United States at the time the Cold War ended. And uh, both the Soviet uh, former uh, Soviet leader, Bismarck, and uh, George Shultz and many others all agreed that if it weren't for Ronald Reagan, the Cold War would probably still be going on. Now, he'll get credit for that in Moscow, but he won't get any credit for that 
in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the rest of the liberal media establishment. Thank you very much, John. Thank you. All right, let's uh, try Phil checking in. Hello, Phil. Yeah, hi, Bob. Well, you were out doing a good deed, raising money in New Jersey. Some of us were at home watching that pathetic news conference on Saturday where the uh, acting in lieu mayor, Norman Spicel, must have figured that Ray Kelly wasn't intelligent enough to point to people who were asking him questions because he kept sticking his finger in front of his nose and telling him, answer that one's question first. Then up stood Jim Florio, and when Jim Florio was asked, why the Port Authority doesn't adhere to New York City Fire Department uh, regulations. He says that the Port Authority is his own agency and is not required by, uh, is not bound by any particular state law. Uh, what a joke. This is absolutely what uh, people get upset about with government, that they, uh, that they pass laws for uh, other people and they ignore them themselves. But the most pathetic thing came from the guy who you uh, attacked in, uh, in your opening statement. It was uh, Il Supremo, who stated that how could something like this happen in the safest city in the world? Well, the last time I looked at the newspaper in 1992, 2,200 people were gunned down in New York City. Hardly what I would call the most safe city in the world. The only thing missing from this three-ring circus was the men's room attendant. But then again, he was off drumming, off, drumming up business in uh, Japan. It was a sad sight, Bob. You're lucky you missed it. Uh, I did miss it entirely because, unfortunately, they do tape those things and they do show them at later hours. And I saw Il Supremo, who I think, I'm beginning to think maybe has a, the uh, um, onset of Alzheimer's uh, with a stupid uh, remark, if it smells like a bomb, if it looks like a bomb, it must be a bomb. Yeah. Um, uh, utterly, incredibly ridiculous. Uh, the contempt I have for Mario Cuomo is, is I, I can hardly contain it. Really, I can hardly contain it uh, in my being. I, I, I just loathe this man uh, beyond, beyond belief. Thank you for the call. Thank you, Bob. Kevin, you're on WABC. What's on your mind this afternoon? Yeah, Bob, I also saw Cuomo on a CNN interview when asked if uh, a lot of these people will be able to relocate to empty office space in New York. He said that there's plenty of empty office space thanks to 12 years of a Republican administration and the, the devastating recession that we've been going through. And this idiot only realized how many millions of square feet were built during the 80s because of the Republican boom. Well, you see, this, this again, uh, here, here is a man who is so bitter because he didn't have the courage. Or maybe there is, well, a, nothing to do maybe the there is a skeleton in his closet after all. <laughs> Why he didn't run, he's got to be eating his heart out. Every time Slick Willie uh, is lauded as the president, any time he sees him, any time he hears the, the word president Clinton, he, yeah, he uh, it's, he's got to secretly be eating his heart out. Because he's got to be thinking, hey, I could have been there. Yeah. I could have been there. And why didn't he uh, do it? One of two reasons, Kevin, and only one of two reasons. Either A, the man just didn't have the stomach for it, the guts for it. Or B, there is a skeleton in his closet. Can't be, can't be anything else. Uh, Phil, you're on WABC. Hello. Yeah, hello, Bob. You know, the uh, timing of the bombing and the decision by Clinton to airlift supplies to Bosnia is striking, but I don't want to make any comparison. No, I don't see a connection there, pal. Okay, Bob, uh, February was a month to reflect on uh, the greatness of the Founding Fathers. And having reread the farewell address of uh, George Washington in 1796, to see his real genius was to see his condemnation of foreign influences on our republic. And uh, he talked about, a, his, he wrote that history had proven that foreign influences was a baleful woe on the Republican government. And I think we were lucky to see his wishes carry forward for 200 years, but I'm afraid that now we're collapsing under this evil of multiculturalism, which is the very evil that Washington spoke about. I thank you. I thank you. On WABC, let's say hello to Ronald. Ronald, hello. Yes, Bob. Uh... I agree with most of what you say, but uh, I, I really can't see any validity in you blaming uh, Mario Cuomo for the bombing. I mean, you know, I'm not he, blaming the bombing on him. The guy's, I didn't blame the bombing on him. The guy's up in, in, in Albany. I mean, hey, dope! I'm not blaming the business. bombing on Blimey him. Blame your uh, I'm not even going to waste time with that idiot. Blame the bombing on him. I'm not blaming the bombing on him. I'm blaming him for what he said. After the bombing. Hello, Jorge. 
Hello, uh, Bob. I would like to talk about MTV and this fluff piece they're going to do on Clinton. I'm sick of the way they pander to this guy, how they, how they just agree with him and how us children should sacrifice and everything. I think they should get some... On WABC, it's exactly not quite 3.30. <laughs> All right, Mike is on the line, checking in from uh, New York. Yes, hello, Mike. Uh, yeah, Bob, uh, with the Waco in Texas, is there any connection with that in the World Trade Center thing happening, or are those two different uh, things? Two entirely different things, as far as anybody knows. Uh, uh, no hint of a connection whatsoever. And, and, and did they ever establish who, was, uh, who took responsibility for the World Trade Center thing? Are you serious? Was it Vladimir? On WABC, uh, let's say hello to uh, Tom. Tom, hello. Uh, not having the death penalty and not using the death penalty, one is just as bad as the other. We're weakening the law enforcement of our country, obviously. I'm talking about New York State and also Florio, who's been in there four years already, has not used the death penalty, said he's for the death penalty. As bad as Clinton is, he did use the death penalty down in Arkansas. When is he going to come to his senses and when are they going to override the that uh, thing up there in, Bo in uh, Al Albany. Uh, never. Thank you. And, uh, WABC, Bob Grant saying hello to Mike checking in right now. Hello, Mike. Hi. How you doing? I uh, wanted to speak to you about a recent article in Friday's New York Times. Um, Elizabeth Holtzman did a survey or whatever, a study of the hotel business, and due to the 22% uh, hotel tax, there was a loss of $1.1 billion uh, to the hotel industry. And she, the liberal, calling for a, re a repealing of that tax. Now, I'm just, don't they realize that this was Reaganomics? What, the tax? No, exactly, to repeal the tax and, and increase business. I mean, that's what she's calling for. Oh, yeah. doesn't she realize that she's following Ronald Reagan's prescription? Uh, exactly. Yeah, well, no, uh, she pro if you did, uh, if you told her that, uh, she would uh, either faint in horror or uh, uh, come up with some... Uh, fake phony uh, cover story uh, to uh, uh, say, no, she wasn't embracing that. Thank you for the call. On WABC, it's David checking in. Hello, David. Yes, good afternoon, Bob. Bob, I'm, I'm really excited about Rory Ennis making his announcement yesterday. And um, I, I really do believe that um, even if he doesn't win, that he's going to make quite an impact on this city. You know, if there's one person who could really... Uh, help pull the city together it's going to be Roy and uh, I told him a few months ago that um, the only thing I feel bad about is that I won't be able to vote for him because I don't live in New York and I want to take this opportunity you know just to, to thank you as I've done so many times uh, for allowing his voice to be heard and my voice to be heard and others of us here in the black community who have a point of view that the media just selectively and deliberately ignores. Well, it's true, David. They, they do deliberately ignore the Davids of Irvington. Uh, for, to a great extent, they ignore Roy Innes. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see what kind of media coverage he will get. Uh, they will probably try to demean his candidacy, belittle it, uh, make light of it. But um, I agree. Uh, Roy could be a... Uh, a, a monumentally uh, uh, historic uh, uh, personage uh, if he were to uh, to win the mayorship, but the uh, odds are pretty much against him because in the Democrat primary, uh, he has uh, very little support. Uh, the irony is uh, the Democrats who will be voting in the uh, New York City primary uh, are not Roy Innes people. Uh, however, in a general election, he would have a much better chance of winning. Yes. That's the great irony. Definitely. And you, you made a point that is right on the money. You know, the, the left-wing radical fringe, they're going to do everything in their power, you know, to find every little uh, uh, impropriety, every little uh, exercise of poor judgment, and they're going to play it up big, you know, and they've got the media in their hip pockets. Why don't we uh, have Roy tell everybody uh, a lie? Why don't we have Roy tell people... He didn't file income tax for four straight years, and then uh, he might get a free ride. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's the irony of it all, uh, Dapper it Dave. <laughs> <laughs> David, good hearing from you. Thank you very much. Okay. How you doing, Bob? Bob, I'm a police officer, and I've been also been a federal officer, and uh, 
I want to first thank you for your unwavering support of all law enforcement officers in this country. And I want to thank you for giving some airtime to the Waco, Texas incident. Um, I'm sure you've been, you've been in the military, you know there's no way to approach a heavily fortified and heavily armed uh, place without uh, putting yourself in a lot of danger, unless you do what you said before, drop a bomb or drive a tank through it first. But you know what the liberals in this country would have done if they did something like that. And uh, I'm sure you remember a few years ago when Gordon Call, the leader of the Posse Comitatus, killed a couple of U.S. Marshals. If you remember when they finally stormed his house and killed him, there was a lot of people, especially in a lot of the liberal media, who uh, had some of his neighbors on television. They interviewed them, talking about how it was unfair, how they just opened up and killed him when they stormed his house. Well, uh, yeah, I remember that. Uh, even though Gordon Call uh, was not the darling of uh, the liberals, uh, hardly. Uh, but, of course, uh, the, uh, the average vintage sick liberal mentality, a very strange sense of priorities. A thousand police could get killed in a gun battle, and if one civilian dies, they're concerned about the one civilian. Of course. I'm sure you remember a few, uh, few months ago when there was a spat of shootings in Newark car thieves who were stealing cars and then driving right, right at cops. Uh, the mayor, Sharp James, made a very, a very... By the way, I'm glad you mentioned Sharp James because tomorrow, uh, maybe I shouldn't say this because who knows, maybe uh, they'll, uh, uh, they'll find me floating in the Passaic River, but I'm, I'm going to say it anyway. Tomorrow, I'm going to tell the tri-state area all about Sharp James and what he has been doing. Uh, I find it absolutely reprehensible beyond belief that newspapers like the Star Ledger, for example, are so afraid, so intimidated by the community that uh, backs Sharp James that they have not written about what Sharp James has been doing. Uh, now, there's a fellow by the name of these, the county executive of Essex County, Tommy D'Alessio, has been indicted. And... Uh, Apparently, uh, Tommy D'Alessio uh, uh, doesn't have the right pigmentation because uh, it would seem to me that, uh, although I'm not exonerating Tommy in any way, shape, or form, uh, when do you hear about what Sharp James has been up to? At the other end of the line is Phil Stern of the Fairfax Group, an international security firm. You're considered an anti-terrorist expert. Uh, Mr. Stern, uh, how does one become an anti-terrorist expert? Well, you, you, our company is in the business of providing security for large corporations. We do large events. Uh, we provided security in 1988 at the Olympics. We developed a lot of expertise in uh, anticipating these problems and telling our clients how to avoid them. I understand. So you, get, you get knowledge by doing. Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Stern, I, I understand lamentably well... Sadly, uh, although it's uh, probably another side of the coin, uh, that business has been very good for your group. Yes, that's correct. It's been uh, quite a weekend. And, of course, uh, that would tell me that uh, there are many firms who had toyed with the idea of anti-terrorist uh, uh, activities, and now that uh, the bombing has taken place at the World Trade Center, now they think it's time to take action. Well, they think it's time to take action, and they also want to know what they can do to protect themselves both here and when traveling abroad, which are main concerns for companies that have international business. Now, does your, uh, does your service extend uh, then uh, to individuals? We, we've had, uh, for example, uh, I believe on two occasions in the past several years, American businessmen who were uh, uh, kidnapped in South America? Yes, uh, our business does... Uh, deal with uh, individuals. Obviously, most of them are, are corporate executives, but from time to time, wealthy individuals have engaged our services both to provide protection for them and to deal with situations should they become hostages. All right. There's no doubt then in your mind that the bombing of the World Trade Center was uh, terrorist-related? Uh, well, I, I, I have a much broader or somewhat broader definition. I think any time you have an attack like this, it's a terrorist attack. The question is, who did it? whether it's an international terrorist or a domestic terrorist or a disgruntled uh, former employee who wants to commit a terrorist act. So in, in terms of that definition, I have no doubt that it's a terrorist attack. Do you think this could have been uh, executed, uh, planned and executed by one individual? 
That's not my belief, but it, it's not beyond belief uh, that one very dedicated person with some knowledge of explosives uh, and some knowledge of the Trade Center and where the vital organs of that building are could have pulled this off. I don't think it happened that way, mm -hmm. but it certainly is possible. Well, now we understand. Uh, when I say we, I mean those of us who uh, aren't uh, uh, the experts that uh, folks like you are that... Uh, it was uh, dynamite that was used instead of uh, plastics, which uh, uh, has been the vehicle for terrorist uh, uh, bombings uh, in the last decade or so. Well, certainly plastic has been a very common uh, explosive used by terrorist groups in the Middle East, Latin America. But interestingly enough, they've used dynamite very often also. Uh, certainly in Latin America, dynamite has been used in, in a car bomb configuration. The dynamite was definitely used at the World Trade Center. That's what the FBI and the police are now saying, and I will have to rely on their lab reports. Obviously, and this is their report, that they have not yet gotten to the epicenter of the explosion, so we don't know for sure. That, that'll come out when they find the vehicle and the detonating devices uh, that made up the bomb, and they'll be able to tell most definitely what, what it was used. Mr. Stern, is it true that... Um 6,000 pounds of dynamite were stolen in the United States in one year? 1991. Three tons. And where, where do these uh, supplies of dynamite, where are they usually found? Well, the thefts occur from any number of sources, mainly from construction sites, mining sites, uh, companies that frequently sell dynamite to, to companies, or, you know, you go to the western part of this country in the midwest dynamite is a very common item for farmers to level trees or to create wells it's, it's not all that difficult to get in this country um, and, you, and you can buy it from licensed dynamite dealers but their security is not that which you would have for c4 or any of the synthetics but uh, you have confirmed that uh, great amounts of dynamite have been stolen that's correct. Indeed, there is, in 1991, there was even a greater amount of composite explosives stolen in this country. I believe about 9,500 pounds of mm. nitrate-type uh, black powder explosives. Not all, not all of that has been used. Therefore, there's a big store of... Well, it is somewhere, Bob. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. There's a big store of uh, illicit dynamite out there just waiting to go off. Well, it, again, the, there are two reasons to steal it. Uh, one is for potential use uh, in this country, uh, and the other is for export. There's a very open market for arms and explosives in other countries, so I don't discount the fact that much of that stolen explosive material might have found itself in the Middle East or other places. We hear the term car bomb an awful lot. Uh, what makes a car bomb a car bomb? The mere fact that you leave the bomb ticking away in a car rather than take it out and place it somewhere? That's right. A, a car bomb is really a, a shorthand definition of how you deliver the explosive to a particular site. And if you want to do great damage, uh, either to persons or property, the easiest way is to load up a car, put a timing device in it, and either park the car in front of or inside of the facility that you want to damage, and then let, let it explode. So it, it, it's a mode of transportation. Immediately, a lot of people began to worry about so-called copycat bombers. Uh, what, uh, in your experience, uh, how often do we get uh, so-called copycat situations? Well, you get, you get that quite often, but you don't get copycat explosions as much as you get uh, threats of the explosions. Threats? Yes, the, the phone calls and, and we're going to blow up this building. Indeed, on Friday, you had a, a bomb threat of the Empire State Building which evacuated that building. You also had airports, uh, and I believe one of the railroad stations had it. Uh, Newark Airport was closed for a short period of time. And I think they believe uh, they found a typewriter. That's right. Uh, so you, you get a lot of copycat threats, uh, very little copycat explosions, because most people don't have the ability to carry through the threat. Mm. Well, it's a very uh, frightening situation here, and that, of course, is... Uh, is, is part of the terror, is uh, not just the actual horrible explosion, but uh, the uh, ramifications it has on the psyche of the average person. That's correct. I mean, it makes you wonder every time you go to a public facility whether you bear any risk. 
uh, and, and that is part of the terrorist goal, is to create fear. And I believe Governor Cuomo uh, was absolutely correct in saying that we should get on with our lives, be cautious, be alert, but not give in to this kind of terrorist tactic. I appreciate you uh, coming to the telephone. Thank you very much, Mr. Stern. Thank you, Bob. Hi, uh, Phil Stern and uh, his company is uh, doing a land office business. His company deals in uh, uh, protecting corporate executives and their employees from terrorist attacks. Hi, Bob. I just uh, was listening to you on Friday, and I, I have two points I want to bring up. That uh, you had some wacko call you up and try to describe, uh, uh, to tell you to, you know, stop bashing Clinton and and what are you doing on the radio? And you got a little flustered and didn't really flustered? answer him the, the way that you should have because there is a word for what you do, and it's called advocacy. You advocate for the truth, and uh, we want you to keep it up, and your listeners, aside from all the other... You know, uh, from the I, didn't get, I, I have news for you, Steve. I didn't get flustered at that call. As a matter of fact, in all, in all candor, I can't recall the last time a call flustered me. I can call, I can recall times when uh, certain individuals annoyed me mm -hmm. or angered me, mm -hmm. but uh, it didn't fluster me at all. Well, you keep up the good work, Bob. Now, the second thing I want to discuss... Gee, thanks, Dad. ...is, uh, is the, uh, uh, you know, Clinton has been attacking the pharmaceutical industry, and my wife works for the pharmace pharmaceutical industry, and I asked her, oh, why would the expenses be, you know, a drug be more expensive in the United States than overseas. And she told me it's simple, that it's the cost of production. When many co uh, countries overseas don't have the, uh, uh, the scrutiny of the FDA looking over them. So if a, dr if a drug wants to be marketed overseas, they go to their agency and do their tests and it costs so much money and then they can market that drug overseas. But then you have to come to the United States, you have to go through the FDA, you have to go through all these th tests again, and only to market that drug in the United States. Many drugs that are marketed overseas are not available in the United States because they would not meet the scrutiny of the FDA. Now, when it, it costs uh, and uh, I'm going to take this drug, DDI, from Bristol Myers Squibb for AIDS. It costs them millions and millions of dollars just to have this tested to prepare it for the market. Now, if they go to market it, this drug overseas, they don't have to do any other testing because most other countries will take anything that is FDA approved. So th there is an enormous cost in marketing a drug. Many drugs don't even make it. To, to, to the point of being marketed, they fail. And there, the, uh, hmm. there is just so much of a, a cost involved that it has to be passed along somewhere. Uh, you're making it sound all too simple, and it's not really all that simple because you can go uh, to various uh, outlets in New York City, for example, and you can find a disparity of as much as 600% in what uh, one druggist will charge uh, over another druggist. So there's more to it than what your wife told you there was, Steve. Isn't that nice fellow, Steve? Nice, accommodating, patronizing fellow. At home listening to the show while his wife is out selling pharmaceuticals. Bob, you're on WABC. What's on your mind? Yes, um, Saturday morning, uh, Mario Crimo said, in response to the bombing, that New York was still the safest place in, in the world. But uh, New York is anything but safe. In fact, uh, if it wasn't for Mario Crimo, we would have had the death penalty here in New York State. Um, and also, during the presidential campaign, crime wasn't even an issue. I mean, uh, people have accepted this as a way of life here. On WABC, we're forging ahead, and uh, that was Bob. Here's another Bob, this Bob from New York City. Yes, Bob. What's on your mind? Are you there, Bob? Uh, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Go ahead, sir. Uh, Bob, would you agree with me that the socialoid Clinton administration is bound and determined to rotomize the American taxpayer? Yes, I would agree with that 100%. Thank you, Bob. And uh, Evans and Novak, who are the twin Cassandras of the American media, 
say that uh, Slick Willie has brought corporate America to its knees because corporate America, composed basically of a bunch of thugs in in three-piece suits, or is it double-breasted? Those double. Well, I'd be glad when the double-breasteds go out of styles, and it'll happen soon. Anyway, these uh, these thugs in uh, in pinstripe suits, better known as corporate executives, uh, like what uh, Slick Willie is doing for them. Can you believe it? But but they do. They're all for him. You know why? Because he's going to turn America into a corporate state. You think I'm exaggerating? Not so. Uh, what he is doing is holding out the carrot of, uh, of um, shall we say, high tariffs. What he's doing is holding out the uh, tariff of uh, uh, the, uh, the carrot of subsidies. Really a slick job. But it's not going to be good for Mr. and Mrs. Average American taxpayer or Mr. and Mrs. Average consumer. Just remember, you heard it right here on the Bob Grant Show on WABC. It's, uh, Bill Clinton and Al Gore like to pass themselves off as uh, accessible to the common man. And with the media coddling them as they do, uh, they're successful with this false image. Anyhow, I tried to speak to Al Gore on Friday on this uh, live call-in show they had for an hour on the Today Show. Um, to my surprise, I got through. And um, I said, they asked me what my question would be. I told them, and I said it would be about the deficit and whether or not the deficit requires these uh, tax increases. Anyhow, they said, could you stay on for a while, like 45 minutes to an hour? I said, yes, I did. About 45 minutes later, a woman comes on who, from the sound of her voice, I assume was Katie Couric, who was sitting next to Al Gore in Washington. She says to repeat my question word for word. And this time I did, and I was more specific, and I probably shouldn't have been. But I said, are there any regrets? for explaining the need for taxing of the middle class as needed due to the deficit and how the deficit amount was a surprise to the new administration. So she said, hold on a minute. Ten seconds later, comes back on and says, would that be all that you say? You know, it, would there be anything else, she said. And I said, well, if, the, if I get the chance, I'd like to mention the Business Week article where Governor Clinton projected a deficit at $400 billion. So she said, hold on again, comes back on, sorry, due to the, due to the time limitations, we won't be able to take your phone call. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm picturing in my mind, uh, if this is the way it happened, her sitting next to uh, Gore, throwing out this question, screening them, and him saying, I'm not taking that one. I mean, could I, do you think that's the way it might have happened? I was frustrated waiting for an hour to speak to him, and, you know, I, I know they just didn't want to take on something like that. Well, not necessarily. It, it might not have been what you think it was. Uh, it might have been uh, just the exigencies of time. If it was Saturday, it wasn't Katie Couric they have. Oh, no, it's Friday, Friday show. Oh, Friday. Okay, then it was, uh, it was, uh, she. Uh, I, I don't, uh, I don't think that you were censored, if that's what you're concerned with. Well, that was, uh, that was, that was, and if I, and if I thought so, I would gladly say so, because <laughs> I despise, there's only about two, three other people I despise more than Gore. Well, the reason I think I was, was because the fact that every time they have these live call-in shows, they get these sweet, you know, of course. questions. Well, that's what they want. They don't want acrimony. They don't really want controversy. And above all, they don't want to embarrass their darlings of the left because they are also of the left. Right. If I had said something like, gee, Mr. Gore, do you think when my child gets older, will, will you have a job waiting for him? I think that probably would have got on. On WABC, we're going to say hello to Paul checking in from Queens. Hello, Paul. Yeah, Bob. I can't believe that you suggested that they should drop a bomb. I remember listening to you back in 86 when uh, the Philadelphia Police Department dropped a bomb on the move. Uh, and I lauded, uh, I lauded Mayor Wilson for doing that. Wilson Good, I lauded him for doing that. Well, I, I know, and that's what I was going to say, and I, I don't understand because you lauded him because of the children that were killed in the bombing. And there are children that are held up now. In the, in the hostage situation in, in Texas. And I yeah. mean, if you drop. Well, anyway, bomb, listen, I tell you what, Paul, you must lead a very empty life. 1986, I uh, appalled you. And now in 1993, you are appalled. Visitor. I Vladimir take it it's a, it's a long time Vladimir between being. Visitor. Get off my phone, you creep. Uh, Tom, what's on your mind? Yes, I'd just like to say if you think the Spanish oh, this guy. has. Hey, Tom, you're persona non grata again. That's it. 
That's it. He became persona non grata again. Whoa, this is true. The Palestinians deserve... What is an Israel disintegrate? Get off my phone and stay off! Hello, Bill. What's on your mind? Hi, Bob. Newt Gingrich and the other 122 Republican congressmen who attended the Princeton conference over the weekend are being raked over the coals for accepting an all-expense free weekend said to be paid for by lobbyists who paid $6,000 each, 10000 if they brought their wives, to uh, defray the train trip, special train, lodging, food, drinks, and entertainment. This has all been discussed for the last two days by your counterpart, an OR. He's going crazy ballistic over this, and telling people to call in, call their congressman, etc. I was wondering what you know about it. Uh, what is it, what is there to call a congressman about? What, what, well, to, he's saying to protest that they're down there at the behest of these lobbyists who are paying for this whole thing, and the lobbyists naturally are going to try to persuade them to do whatever lobbyists try to do. Well, that's what lobbyists do, pal. That's uh, uh, look. We should either we should e- we should be consistent. We should either uh, forbid lobbyists from lobbying, or we should accept the fact that uh, they do lobby. Well, uh, he, even uh, even Slick Willie says uh, uh, lobbyism, uh, being a lobbyist, is a uh, uh, is a is a profession, is a job uh, that is not illegal. And you know what? He's right. It's not illegal. Well, not illegal to lobby. This is true. That he. Thank you for the call. Yeah. Okay. Uh, WABC, the people who lead small lives, ladies and gentlemen, small lives. We try to put a little, just a little, uh, significance into those small lives as best we can. I mean, well, yeah, after the bomb blast. And to me, he made light of it. You know, if it looks like a bomb, it smells like a bomb, it's a bomb. Yeah. To me, to, I don't know, this guy is a spustad or what? I mean, just the things he says and the way he comes out with them. Well, I think uh, maybe he is uh, getting spooched on. Yeah, I, I think so. You say Florio was a fighter, right? He got hit too many times in the head. Yeah, he's brain dead. Jimmy Florio's brain dead, but uh, uh, he, moves, he moves around. They wind him up every morning. Uh, Lucinda uh, winds him up. Every... By the way, why does she have that big fat salary and the uh, and the staff? What the hell is she? What was she elected to? Anyway, yeah, what do you want to say, Richie? Yeah, I want to say, uh, yeah, Mario played baseball, right? Maybe got hit too many times in the head with the hardball. I mean, this guy, this guy is a joke. I mean, and another thing, he says all of a sudden he's going to get the people who did this. Does he realize there was 2,000 murders in this state last year? In the city. In, in the, the city. city alone, yeah. city alone. On WABC, it's Frank checking in. Hello, Frank. Hi, Bob. I was driving upstate to my home in Orange County when I heard you talking to that gentleman for the BATF. Yes. I'd like to point out, he lost four men enforcing a law that says basically you cannot have a gun that fires more than one bullet with one pull of the trigger. Meanwhile, the New York Daily News publishes the recipe on how to make a bomb that could devastate the city. Just number two, fuel oil and fertilized pellets. I mean, if you think about it, it's kind of ridiculous. Were these people using their so-called illegal weapons for any illegal purpose? Were they out there mugging people, killing people? They attacked the compound, and they got basically what they deserved, I think, the BATF. Oh, they didn't deserve to get killed. No, I, well, that's true. I shouldn't say that. Come on, but come I on. wish you would have asked the BATF agent how many uh, innocent and law-abiding people in America that they have killed and wounded just within the past 10 years trying to enforce a law that was passed by Franklin Roosevelt trying to disarm the American citizens. On WABC, let's say hello to Alex checking in on the line. Hello, Alex. Good day. Um, I'd like to ask, there seems to be some kind of a double standard. I'd like to know how you feel about it. Between... These folks in Waco, um, last few years there was incidents uh, in Idaho, and Mr. Walker, uh, Gordon Call of the Posse Comitatus Group, et cetera, et cetera, so-called white supremacists in a lot of cases. Um, and meanwhile, in a place like L.A., we've got 100,000 Crips and Bloods who bum-rush the city and cause unbelievable destruction, who engage in a constant low-intensity conflict against this nation, and along with what you're saying about you know, the state of affairs in New York and Mr. Cuomo's vision of, of what the city is. Uh, why is it that we don't seem to, to take their threat as seriously when I think it's even a greater threat to us? Well, you're talking about a lot of different uh, situations here. In uh, the case of uh, Posse Comitatus, uh, federal agents had their orders uh, to uh, enforce a federal law, and in attempting to do that, uh, they were shot down. 
In the case of uh, in Waco, Texas, again, federal agents uh, had orders to enforce a law, and they were shot down in attempting to storm uh, that bastion. In the case of uh, Los Angeles, it wasn't uh, so much a group uh, being holed up in a fortress. It was uh, an eruption in the city streets. Uh, I think um, you have two different situations, and you have to deal with them in different ways. You think that the, the difference being greatest, that, that, that one occurs in an urban area and the other is in a rural area? No. I, I, if, if the Crips or the Bloods had taken hostages and were holed up in a building, let's say, in south-central Los Angeles... Uh, there might have been a firefight, there might have been uh, uh, a shootout, uh, and uh, uh, they might have had to uh, storm the building. But uh, that isn't what actually happened in, uh, in Los Angeles. They're two different things. Terrorism, uh, nevertheless, but uh, different uh, manifestations of that terrorism. I'd just like to say also that I think in light of, of the bombing and uh, the, the state of affairs in our streets vis-a-vis -vis criminals and... Uh, the falling of the scuds during the Gulf War. I'd just like to say I hope a lot of listeners out there and a lot of average Americans starting to come to realize what the Israelis are up against. Uh, thank you very much. Well, I doubt that. If you, th if you, think, if you think for one minute, Alex, uh, that is going to be a fallout from all of this. Uh, you've got another thing coming, but I uh, thank you for the call. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we've already, uh, we've already consigned to uh, the uh, Radio Hall of Fame Museum.